you have for about, say, uh, Amazon EC2? Okay. How many of you have heard about Google App Engine? How many, how many of you have used Google App Engine? Oh, okay, three of you. So sorry for three of you guys. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Google App Engine. Okay. So first, uh, we also you know, start introducing what is Google, Google App Engine. So this is the quote from the Google, uh, Google's website. So it says, Google App Engine lets you run web applications on Google's infrastructure. Okay. So what's the big deal? <coughs> Google is the most uh, popular search engine in the US. Right? So every day, Google needs to take care of a lot of queries. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what is the exact number, but a huge amount of queries every day, right? So Google now, Google has the, uh, the, the capacity to deal with huge uh, amount of queries and they can process it very fast at a very large scale. So basically now, if you want your program to be scalable, what you have to do is you just you know, uh, develop your application and then deploy it on Google's infrastructure. And then you don't need to worry about the scaling problem. So this is uh, Google App Engine. So then, um, in assignment, uh, in assignment two, right, okay, so you guys need to set up your own uh, development environment for the, for the you know, uh, server-side programming and client-side programming. So then the traditional approach basically is, you know, you buy a server. So in a server queue, basically, Havan and Alan did was, you know, they, you know, we have HBCO server, so I think all of you guys are aware of that. So that is, uh, you need to get a server first. And then you install all these uh, software packages. Uh, the web server Apache or the database MySQL, right? And the server container Tomcat or different other you know, uh, programming uh, language environments. Okay? And then you develop your application, then you test it, and then you deploy to the server. And then you need to maintain it, right? Sometimes the server may go wrong, then you need to keep monitoring the application and see how is everything going. So that is the traditional way to do that. And uh, if I remember it correctly, you know, some of you even have the problem to uh, set up the environment, right? So it's a lot of, you need to do a lot of, sometimes you know, setting up the environment is not that trivial. It may take you a day just to set up the environment. And then you can start doing your meetings. Okay. So now, if you use Google App Engine, okay? So uh, the first advantage is it can do dynamic web serving means it can dynamically generate these web pages, okay, not just static web pages. So now the languages that uh, Google App Engine supports is uh, Java, uh, Python, and Go. So uh, I, I think you know, most people have heard about Java, and Python is an integrated language, language which is very popular in, in, inside Google. And Go, actually, uh, does anyone know about what is the language Go? Google. Yes, yes, yeah. So basically, it's, um, the one, the, so, um, uh, so for the Python, it's an integrated language, right? So for the integrated language, basically, it's, uh, uh, it's not, so it's, uh, broadly speaking, you can divide languages into compiling, compiling languages and integrated languages. So the compiled, uh, com compiled language basically is like, say, C. So first you do the compiling, and then you get the binary codes, and then you just you know run this uh, binary codes by the operating system. So another category would be the interpreted language, say uh, for Java or Python. Basically, we don't generate the binary code, right? but we have an interpreter which will uh, interpret the code you write. Okay. So then the difference is because. You, we didn't compile it ahead of time, and then we started interpreting the 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 the, the, program, the program files. Then it is a little bit yes. I was wondering, is uh, Perl is noticeably absent? Is Python taking over that role, or? Uh, I don't have any comments on that. I know there are <coughs> uh, a lot of uh, programming languages already, and uh, more and more new languages are coming. Mm -hmm. So I think whatever you are comfortable, then just. One, that is my opinion. Uh, yeah, I, yeah I was just curious. It was right. just like one of those. It's like, well, Perl is usually sort of like what Python, uh, there's dire similarities, and it's sort of like it's very good for doing like a lot of the heavy lifting behind the scenes, uh, right. pairing data and things like that. So 
So uh, then the Go language basically uh, is a compiled language, and the design and the design program is to make it you know very uh, very efficient and uh, highly you know uh, uh, the compound programming so that you know uh, you can run a lot of the uh, do a lot of current programming at the same time. So you will improve the the system performance. Okay. So then uh, the second advantage is the automatic scaling and load balancing. So say in our case, let's say you know you you develop a fantastic application and it's deployed on the noisy HPC server. Okay? And uh, in the beginning, say you know, just uh, 30 students you know, here we are using your application. And then because of because of the you know virus effect and uh, the application got very famous. And uh, you know a lot of people from uh, in US, inside uh, outside US, uh, you know, all of a sudden they started using your application. And then let's say if a server can handle just uh, just for one example, let's say can handle uh, say five thousand you know uh, requests per uh, per minute, right? If you get more requests than that, and then the server cannot answer more you know requests, right? And then what we need to do, we need to scale your application. And then what you need to do, you need to repeat the cycle again. So what you do is you get new server, and then you set up the environment. So all these things. Okay, uh, but when it comes to Google App Engine, and then you don't need to worry about that. So we just deploy your application on the Google's infrastructure. And then say if there are you know, more and more requests you know, for your application, and then Google will automatically assign more resources to your application. So in that case you don't need to worry about that. Um, so the idea basically is Say if the, if your application is very popular, is very busy, right? And Google will assign you know, more CPU to your processes. If your uh, program or if your application is not that popular, and then you can just you know several uh, application processes will just share one CPU. So now when it comes to the perspective of cost, then you will be saving a lot of money. The thing is, your website will not always have a constant. Volume, right? So let's say uh, if you think about some uh, uh, deep, uh, some say you know, uh, shopping website, maybe you know during weekdays maybe it's okay okay, but you may have a pack in the weekend. And when it, when it comes to Black Friday, then you have a you know a bigger uh, pack, right? So in that case, if you do it in a traditional way, let's say to handle the Black Friday case, let's say if you need. 10,000, okay, that's too much. Let's say 100 servers, okay? Okay, so then, what will happen, what will you do with these 100 servers after Black Friday? You'll be only need, say, uh, 10 servers. Then what do you do? Because these servers, they will be there, right? They will, you know, consume electricity and you pay for that. So in Google App Engine, uh, it's a different story. So basically, you pay as you go. You just pay whatever you have used. So. In, uh, on Black Friday, you have a lot of requests, and then you pay more money. And during normal weekdays, you just pay you know, less money. Okay, so that, that is the advantage. Um, previously, I talked about um, to set up in the environment, we need to somehow save the data in the database, right? Okay. So that is why you need to install MySQL, and you need to maintain it, you need to manage it. So in Google App Engine, they have their own storage system which is uh, called data store and uh, the the cheap word is, uh, is a query language which is uh, similar to SQL. Um, from the previous uh, from the feedback from previous classes I know some of you guys you know, don't know much about SQL so I won't go uh, deep inside the uh, and the, the data store. But basically what will happen is um, if you want your program to be very efficient to retrieve the data very fast, right? We, what we need to do is we need to do some offline processing, basically index it, right? So if you if you index it ahead of time, then uh, when you when you come to retrieve the data, it will be very fast. So if you save your data in the data store, and uh, Google will index uh, almost all of the columns, all of your data. So when you come to retrieve it, it will be very fast. However, it has a um, it has a restriction. 
which is in SQL you can join you know, two tables, but in, uh, in Google Data Store, uh, that is not possible. So the schema is, is denormalized instead of normalized. Does it make sense? Because I see a lot of confusing faces. So, okay, so in the, in the normalized schema fashion, what will happen is, let's say, um, uh, we normalize the data into different tables, okay? And then, let's say, let me give you one example. Uh, let me see, this will be a good example. Let's say, uh, take the twin data for example, right? Okay, so now, let's say we, so now let's say we have two tables. The first one is a Twitter data table. Scale, right? 
you you may or you may not have a lot of data. So let's say in this table is huge, let's say you know, uh, millions of rows. And this table also has millions of rows. Right? Then we need to join, it will be millions by million. So then there'll be a lot of you know uh, computing. Right? So in, in this case, basically uh, then we sacrifice the space for the sake of uh, performance. you want to develop the Google app, uh, develop the Google, uh, Google app application, it's actually very easy. So all you have to do is to just download the. Uh, all you have to do is download this. This is called you know, Google app engine launch. Of course, you need to install. You know, if you want to use Python, you need to install the Python environment. Right? So all you have to do is to download this. Okay, and then you can uh, then you are set to go. You can test your program from your local environment or you can test the program uh, you know, upload it, deploy it to the server and test it on the server so that's it, it's very easy okay um, and later we will show uh, three uh, examples um, using the Google App Engine and I will show you it's very very easy to configure your application okay. just uh, you know, several parameters very easy to configure and you don't need to worry about the maintenance, maintenance you don't need to worry about the downtime of the server you know, because Google will take off that. Okay, so now we have talked about Google App Engine and they ask you, you know, cloud computing. So in the beginning, this confused me a lot because I say, okay, um, uh, we have, you know, Google App Engine, which is what I just introduced. And we have uh, Amazon EC2, okay? Because not everyone know, uh, knows about Amazon EC2, so I will explain a little bit. So Amazon EC2 basically is um, Amazon is can is providing some uh, you know renting service so that you can rent some virtual machines from Amazon. Uh, basically, you say Amazon will have you know uh, powerful machines, and then it will run several virtual machines on top of every physical machine. And then you can you know, rent these machines from Amazon. And then, but, oh uh, yes. Can you install like applications on these machines then so you can use them? Yes, you can. Awesome. So there's no difference. So the only difference is, is uh, it's a virtual machine, but it's like, uh, it's like a server. You can access it remotely. You can specify, uh, you know, whatever operating system you want to use. You can say Ubuntu, you can say uh, Windows. So whatever you like. And then you can install MySQL. Basically, it's like um, it, it is like you know you just have this machine, uh, but it's actually you know it's hold, this machine that hosted on Amazon. Okay. Or the IaaS. Right. So not yes. So basically, a good example might be like Google Docs, where you store the Google documents on Google itself, and you don't retrieve them anywhere else. On that certain point, you can log in. Not being on something else. Mm -hmm. Google, Do uh, Google Docs is also, you know, it's kind of, it's also a type of uh, cloud computing, which I will introduce a little bit, uh, actually I'll just on this slide, so stay with me, okay. So now my question is, so what is, uh, you know, what is cloud computing to do with, uh, say, Google App Engine, right? So before we start, let's say, what is cloud computing? So this is from Wikipedia, everybody uses Wikipedia. Uh, cloud computing is the use of uh, computing resources. <coughs> Excuse me. Hardware and software that are delivered as a service over a network, typically the internet. Okay. And then it also receives a infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software storage. Okay. Different types of cloud computing. So now my first question is, let's say in the Google App Engine case, uh, which type does it belong to? We have four of them. So how many of you? If you think it's, it's the first one, raise your hand. Nobody. The second one, platform. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Uh, software as a service. Okay. Uh, storage as a service. <coughs> okay. So less than. Uh, guys, you guys should be more uh, active. <laughs> 
Oh, actually, I, I missed that one little piece. Are you saying like Google Docs? Because it's it's sort of a little bit of both. You have storage, you have the software that behaves much like an office program. It kind of borders on a platform with a little bit of infrastructure. So it's, it's sort of like all the above. I mean, it's a simple thing. But the thing is, is that you can, you know, it is the reason for is on a platform is that essentially anybody can use it from anywhere. You know, it's very agnostic as far as what it runs on. So, yeah, so, it's sort of like almost all of the above. <laughs> um, okay, uh, let's start it one by one, right? So, infrastructure as a service. So, the Amazon uh, EC2 example I just gave, right? That is yeah. the infrastructure as a, as a service uh, uh, example. Basically, you know, they provide you the infrastructure, but you know, uh, you need to maintain it, right? They give you a lot of machines, you maintain it by yourself. That is the infrastructure as a service. And then platform as a service would be the Google App Engine. They provide, you don't see operating systems you know, inside the Google App Engine. They have a, a, a platform, which is the Google App Engine. You develop your web application on top of that uh, platform, and then that's it. So software as a service would be the, uh, uh, the Google Doc example, right? So they provide you the software, you can use it from anywhere, you don't need to install it, you know, on your local machine, you can, as long as you have a browser, you can use it. So, the last one, storage as a service. And anyone can be one example. Yeah, that is uh, the first thing that you found on the issue. What? Amazon is issue. Um, it's um, Amazon's uh, long term storage. Is, is it similar to S3, but it's a... Uh, yeah, but the long term. Okay. So uh, the reason why I want to clarify this concept is, you know, uh, when you get to out, you get to go and have a job, you know, during the interview, you, know, you know, what is the cloud computing? Well, some of you may already knew it. Anyway, it doesn't hurt to refresh your memory. Okay. <clears throat> so now, uh, I will talk about, you know, more using, you know, words to, to introduce what is Google App Engine, but how does it run, okay? So this is the architecture. So uh, so here would be our browser, right? Or, you know, some other uh, type of client. We send a request to the application, right? Let's say, <coughs> because Google supports uh, Python, uh, Java, and uh, Go. Right? Let's take the Python one, for example. And then this request will be uh, directed to the Python virtual machine process. As I explained before, you know, it's not the, uh, the compiled language. Basically, you know, there is a virtual machine interface of application. Right? So then the request will be sent to this Python virtual machine process. And then this guy will execute our application here. And here we have some you know, standard library here so that some uh, basic operations. And uh, if you want to save your data, and then you can save the data to the data store here, right? You can also you know, retrieve the data. And uh, so here they have some other you know, APIs. You can send email, you can fetch URL, so you can get images, okay? So now, this part. So how many of you have heard about main cache? Okay, so do you want to explain what is memcache? Uh, uh, vaguely, it's just a way to store cache data in memory just to allow for the group of words. Yes. So, okay, um, so basically it's um, when you send a request to the server, right? Then the virtual machine is to execute our program, then return the page, okay? But let's say if the page is always, you know, say the same, right? Then we don't need to go all the way through executing our application. We can instead, we can just you know, save the, re the page in memory. Whenever you send a request, right, I just return the page to you. So then it will be a lot faster. So this one can you know, improve the, the scalability. So um, again, it's my style, right? I want to ask you questions. So uh, in the HTTP request, we have uh, two requests. One is get, one is post. So now my question is, which 
request should we should be cached here? Is it HTTP get or is it HTTP post? You're smiling, so I know you know the result. <laughs> yeah, get. Why? Because get is used when you're trying to retrieve information, and post is used when you're trying to give information. Um, oh, no. Yes, no, that, that's right. But I mean, for the for the um, so this is so for both queries, right? Uh, uh, request, sorry, the, the get and the post. Okay, you can pass parameter to the server, right? So in the HTTP get request, you encode these parameters in the URL, mm -hmm. right? But in the post, it's a, it's a different story. Okay, so basically, both uh, requests they can send a parameter to the server. Okay, but by convention, by convention is that if it's a guest, uh, if it's a get request, you are not supposed to change anything on the server. Let's say if I want to post a tweet, right? So you should use the the, the, the post instead of get. Okay, for the get basically you just retrieve something from the server and you don't change it. And uh, the reason why we are doing this is, uh, uh, let me show you the. So this is Chrome, right? Uh, let me see. Chrome has something. Uh, Python uh, 2.7, right? So 
So this is, we say say that, and whether this is the rest of it, we say true. Okay, so here, say handlers, so what does this mean? This means, so all the requests, right, will be, you know, handled by this script, which will be hello world dot, um, hello world, you know, Python script. So all these requests will be handled by this script, okay? And uh, actually we don't need this one. So in case if you need some, you know, um, libraries other than the default Python ones, and then you say, you know, libraries, and what are the name, what, what is the volume number, okay? So, Yes. 
start deploying deployment. So you just you know be patient and wait for some time. Yes. Do they charge you anything for that, or does that come with your account? Or? Oh, good question. Uh, so I think they have some uh, amount of free works, so you can you, you use it. So for now, they are not charging me anything. If you were using it for a business, though, they probably would. Uh, it depends on the volume of you know your traffic. If it's heavy, then they will, they will charge you. But I, I don't think it will be very very expensive. Okay. So when I was trying this out, right? So because I see here, it says you know uh, checking if deployments succeed, right? So I thought you know we'll check again. I thought it is constantly checking, okay? So then when I go uh, go to the, the website and but it was not working, okay? So you have to wait until you can see, yeah, uh, completed update, you know this one, uh, complete update of the app, and then you can go there and check. Um, I know it's like more than 10 people have laptops, so you can just, you know, uh, this is the one, right? So I just say, yeah, so you can try it with me. Now you can see how to work it out. So it's, uh, it's very easy. Okay, so so far, uh, are we, because I have two more examples to show. Okay, so I just Okay, let's try to 
got in this. So you go to some ipchicken.com or somewhere, then you will get your public ID. If you provide that information, then you will get it. I see. Uh, I think we can try this one. Because when I tried this one, it worked for me last time. So we can try it. OK. So now it knows you know, I'm from Italy. Okay. 
detail of I only specify the country code. Right? The JSON, this is the key, which will be the country code. Right? This, this will be US. And then we are also interested in the C, which will be data. And then we just, you know, uh, compare these two strings and then return. So let me uh, go to the flow again. So basically for get request, uh, you know, we uh, get the timestamp here, and then we print out the timestamp, so we know when you access it. And uh, then we print out your IP address, and then based on the IP address, then we, you know, decode the IP address into a location, and then we print it out. Okay, so now let me try it first on the local machine. First, and make sure it is working.
Okay, so now let me, let me come to HTML. <laughs> okay, so we expect that the, the content type would be HTML. Otherwise, there's no way we can show the, the form. Okay, and then we say response starts right form. Right, so that what is form. Okay, so form here basically is the string which is here. So this is the one. This is like um, <coughs> it's the same you know HTML tags as used before. So this time it's in Python, but you know the syntax is exactly the same. So uh, this the the submit the submit um, the, uh, the, it will be a post request, right? So I have a label here, and uh, you know uh, the input text will be uh, screen name. Okay. So now because for now if you look at here, the the get request is very straightforward. Right? We just show the form. Okay. So let's and the guest get the best first. We're interested in actually not just tweets, it should be the timeline, and we're interested in getting uh, give us specific username, screen name, then we want to get this added. Thank you. 
we see the API version, so here we specify what's you know, on 1.1. So in the new version, there is explicit file authentication, but we didn't provide any username and password. So instead, we just use the old one. So you can see you know, if you return you a JSON, and you can have you know, the text here. So basically, you know, so it's similar like how we give to the convert the uh, URL to a location. So this time, all we need to do is to provide the string name of a Twitter user. Okay. So now let's look at here. So once the user click on the submit button, it will be here, right? Then we are going to be uh, sending a post request. So in that case, we need to deal with the post request here. So first we specify, say, uh, uh, you know, it will be HTML. Okay. And uh, because the, in the form, we specify the admin name is the screen name, right? So then we just get the screen name, we use the screen name here, okay? And uh, this is another uh, method, which is get tweets, basically given the name, and then it will return the tweets uh, of that user, okay? So let's look at this method, get tweets. Okay, so now it says that it's <laughs> 
Yeah, I don't know, it scales it. 